Okay, I would like to welcome everybody to the 8th uh, Scientific Symposium for the Interstellar Research Group. Um, we've been doing these for a number of years now. Um, this is, interestingly enough, our first symposium outside the United States, and we're very happy to be here in McGill. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of history about the organization, then I'm going to call Les Johnson up to give us an overview of um, um, what we do now. Um, the Interstellar Research Group originally started um, from a group of friends and science fiction fans in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, they were attending a local science fiction convention in Chattanooga called LibertyCon and got to talking to each other and saying, you know, we have other things in common besides just science fiction. We're We're all engineers, we're all scientists, we really ought to start talking about things a little more, less fictional, let's say. So over a couple of years, they had some casual conversations. And then in July of 2011, and Les is going to talk a little bit more about this, in Aosta, Italy, at the IAA's seventh biennial symposium on realistic near-term space missions, folks were sitting together and saying, Let's do one of these ourselves. And from that, the organization, which was originally named the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, was formed. Um, the whole region or region reason for the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop was to have a regional symposium in the southeastern United States. And originally, these symposia were held every 18 months. But we had a number of presenters come to us quietly and saying, don't do it, so we don't have anything new to say. So uh, we're doing them every two years. now. Um, we reorganized in August of 2020 to be the Interstellar Research Group instead of the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop because we were running out of locations in the Tennessee Valley watershed to hold the uh, symposia. And that allowed us to go to Wichita, Kansas, and Tucson, Arizona, and Montreal, Quebec. Um, we hold these bienni biennially now, as I say. Um, and we will talk later in the week about where the 2025 symposium is going to be. But right now, I would like to ask Les Johnson, where are you? there you are, Les, to come up and give us an overview of the meetings and proceedings. Thanks, Doug. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm thrilled to see everybody here. Like uh, Doug said, this is our first international meeting, and it's also our first meeting under the auspices of the International Academy of Astronautics, which is a huge step forward for our organization, and we're thrilled uh, to be affiliated and part of the organization of IAA, and we appreciate their support in uh, getting the word out and, and helping us get this moving. A couple, little bit of backstory. Um, the, the TNRC Valley Interstellar Workshop, which is the progenitor organization of this, a lot of people who aren't familiar with the Tennessee Valley in the southeast United States need to realize the brain power that lies along that valley. Uh, we start, it starts up in Knoxville, Oak Ridge area, home of uh, the DOE's Oak Ridge National Laboratories, a premier nuclear research facility in the country, runs through Chattanooga, Tennessee, who keeps the lights on uh, throughout the entire southeast with the Tennessee Valley Authority and the power grid, and goes right past Huntsville, where I'm from, uh, which is the home of the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center and uh, lots of uh, uh, strategic military assets that are involved in space and space exploration. 
So when when we formed this organization, it was it was people all along the Tennessee Valley who had gotten together and decided, you know, we've got a lot to contribute to this field. Uh, at that time, the Hundred Year Starship Organization had formed and was taking uh, a, a big national approach, and we thought we'd kind of focus on regional and be our contribution to this common vision we have of us becoming an interstellar species someday in the future. And as that organization grew, we found that we were getting people from all over the world who were coming to the Tennessee Valley to attend our meetings. And that was one of the reasons that the organization decided it was time to, uh, to change its name and consider branching out beyond the Tennessee Valley. I'm real proud of this organization. It also now sponsors uh, undergraduate and graduate uh, student scholarships. Uh, we have uh, some corporate sponsors uh, who provide money to us to administer the scholarship program Comp competition every year. And so we're, we're really thrilled to be able to send money to students uh, in the United States, uh, primarily in the Southeast, uh, uh, is where that has been designated in the past. And uh, papers from this symposium, as some of you may be aware, who are presenting, uh, we've actually had some special issues in the uh, Journal of the British Interplanetary Society, and uh, most recently with Acta Astronautica, one of the most premier journals in aerospace in the world. And so this meeting has gotten uh, more and more uh, notoriety and has gotten more recognition as a place to go for discussions of things about deep space. One, one last uh, comment about the culture of the meeting. You heard about the, inter the, the science fiction community connection. I too have been going to science fiction conventions since I was in high school, and no, I don't wear Spock ears uh, when I go to these things. But one of the things that we like to have is our meeting to have a personality. And so our technical meeting here is uh, focused on the technical, but we don't just do that. You're gonna hear paper, papers and discussions on space law, ethics, culture. If we're going to become an interstellar species, it's not just gonna be the scientists and engineers. It's gonna be everybody who has to do this. And if we want to build momentum, get interest, and most importantly, get funding for the kinds of things that will enable this future that most of us here envision for us, it's going to have to be more than just scientists and engineers. So I would encourage you as you're, as you're out uh, in your communities, make sure you also reach out to the law students, co technical communicators, uh, anyone in your community who shares this vision because we can all contribute. And at this meeting, you'll have a little bit of that. We've done that with intentionality. It's not just engineering and science lectures. Also this week, uh, something you'll, you'll come to love, we hope, is another science fiction connection that we've brought into it. And it's called in, con in convention land, it's a, called a con suite, here we call it a hospitality suite. And basically that's in the evenings and times when there aren't seminars and other activities going on. We have a room opened up uh, where there will be uh, libation and snacks and an opportunity for us to get together and socialize and do those informal discussions, which have in my experience at meetings and conferences led to partnerships and collaborations. So we want you to have fun while you're here. And I do, I warned him I was going to call him out. We have an attendance, uh, the consulting chief scientist for the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Organization at NASA, where I also happen to work. And his name's Ron Turner. And Ron attended a couple of our meetings. And he pulled me aside after the meeting, I believe it was in Wichita, and said, Lex, this is unlike any technical meeting I've been to. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> so we hope that, you, you, you know, you learn something. You share your work with your colleagues. You socialize, plan, coordinate, and also when the week is over, look back and say, man, that was fun. You know, we, we had a good time talking about the future and the future that we want to enable. So that's the culture here. We welcome you into that. We look forward, to, I look forward to meeting folks I have not met. Um, I was one of the founders. Um, one, one last comment, I talked forever. Sorry, Andrew, I'm throwing you behind schedule. Um, when, when this community first, I got introduced to this community, uh, uh, it, one of the first people I met was uh, Dr. Claudio McConey, who you'll be hearing speak here today. He's been involved in IAA and the interstellar community for a long time. Interstellar was kind of a dirty word in the science and technical community. It was laughed at. It was scoffed at. People didn't talk about it much. And they had a euphemism. They called them ultra deep space missions. And they had a conference, the conference in Alsta, where this idea came about and was taken to the science fiction community was at one of these meetings on ultra deep space missions. And uh, I came to learn that that meant interstellar. So here we are, we can be in the open now, and I, I welcome you all to, uh, to where we are, and I'll turn it over to our general chairman. I, I also wanna give accolades to Andrew. He has been a fantastic general chairman. I'm the program chair helping to pull together all that, but he has pulled this together. Tremendous students. Who had trouble getting here this morning? Probably nobody, because you were intercepted by a student who helped you get here, and we really appreciate all the help.
Bienvenue and welcome. Uh, on behalf of my co-chairs Alex Ellery and Michel Lamontagne, it's a great honor to host the first interstellar symposium located outside the United States. I'll say a few words about our venue this week, McGill University. McGill University is an English language university, about 40,000 undergraduate and graduate students, and it was founded in 1821, so we've just passed our, our bicentennial celebration. Just a few words about the room here. Uh, most of you came in through the back of the auditorium, uh, but there are entrances and exits on either side of the podium here. And these lead to an elevator. So if you have any concern about going up and down the steep stairs, when you come into the Leacock lobby, you can just take an elevator right down and walk right in uh, on this level without going on any, any steps. The restrooms are also located here on the lower level. So if you go out this way, take a left and a right, you'll find the restrooms. So in your conference bag, I think everybody got an orange uh, bottle courtesy of AWS. Uh, we'd encourage you to use that. There's water uh, filling stations in the lobby. And so we're gonna try to regreen and avoid using disposable water bottles. So try to use your, your orange, orange bottle. The theme for our symposium this week is inspired by the art that our artist Alistair Temple made for the symposium poster. And in working with Alex Ellerly and, and Michelle Lamontagne in designing this poster, we, we thought this reflected the idea that after completing the most difficult journey that the human mind can conceive, going to another star, what will it be like for the first time to feel the warmth or the light of another sun? So we just ask everyone to keep that theme in mind this week. If you want to promote the meeting on social media, you can use the hashtag IRG, Interstellar Research Group 2023, or in the light of other suns. So if you need help with anything, we have a team of student volunteers. They're hopefully easy to identify. They should be wearing these blue shirts with the, with the uh, symposium theme on the back, and they have a red McGill cap. So if you have any trouble, need any help, just, just go find them. So um, most of the venue will be in this room. So all of the technical presentations, the, the uh, panel discussions during the day will be, will be in this room. But there's going to be some evenings, uh, evening events and, and events outside this room, and I'll just briefly run through these. So today at 4 p.m., so when the last presentation finishes at 4, uh, a bunch of these people with the blue shirts and the red hats are going to rush in and start breaking you up into groups of 10 to 12 people to bring you on a tour of our labs in the engineering complex here at McGill. And you're going to get to see a hypervelocity launcher, the fastest gun ever built, the fastest gun in existence, can reach velocities of 12 kilometers a second. You'll see a prototype of a magnetized target fusion device. Uh, you'll see a prototype of a laser thermal rocket, a rotating detonation engine, a facility for looking at dynamic loading on thin light sails, and uh, high altitude balloon work that we're doing, uh, hopefully gearing up to do eventually a CubeSat mission. As the tours end, the tour guides are going to bring you to the Delta Hotel. That's one of the conference hotels, the main conference hotel, for a Montreal tradition called a saint set. I'll leave it to you to figure out what that means, uh, but it's going to be a wine, cheese, cocktails uh, from uh, the end of the tours till about 7 p.m. And at 7 p.m., we want you to come back here to the Leacock building, not to this room, but the room that's just off the lobby, Leacock 132, for a public outreach event that we're going to do this evening. So. The idea of this event is uh, Les Johnson, uh, who just spoke to you, is going to present a panel of four speakers from the symposium here this week so that the general public can get a little bit of a feel for the kind of ideas and discussions that happen at the Interstellar Symposium. And the discussion is going to be led by, emceed by Trevor Cahurlian. So he is a local Montreal area, astronomy, science, uh, educator, popularizer. So I think it's going to be a really interesting discussion having Trevor interact with Les and Les sort of present some of the experts that we've selected from the symposium to speak at that event. So we have 650 people signed up for this event this evening. So please try to be early. If you show up at 730, very good chance you just won't get a seat. So uh, enjoy the, the, the social uh, reception, but uh, around 7, it would be good to be heading back to the Leacock building here. 
After the event tonight, we invite you to come up to the hospitality suite. So the hospitality suite is the top floor of the Delta Hotel. If you are staying in the Delta Hotel, you can get up to the 23rd floor with your room key. If you're not staying at the Delta, then uh, just find the elevators um, in, uh, off the lobby, and there should be somebody with a blue shirt and a red hat that will get you in an elevator up to the 23rd floor and up to room 2302. And it's a penthouse uh, uh, suite, and we have it all to ourselves. The hotel has told us we can stay as late as we want and be as loud as we want. So we want to try to recreate the magic that we had in, in Chattanooga at the Fourth Symposium. We had a really good hospitality suite there, so we want to get back to that, that vibe. Uh, now going to tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, we're going to have a luncheon uh, presentation from Michelle Hanlon. And then on Tuesday evening, we're going to have a science fiction panel. And we're pleased that we're going to have three Canadian science fiction authors and Les Johnson. And this will be at the Delta Hotel. There'll be cocktails served. And that will go from 6 to 8 p.m. And again, after 8 p.m., we invite you to go up again to the 23rd floor to the hospitality suite. Uh, Wednesday night is the banquet, and I have one last surprise. This is, hasn't been announced yet, but our banquet speaker is going to be uh, McGill Professor Jessica Kuhn. So uh, Jessica Kuhn is a professor of linguistics, and she was hired in 2015 to work on the film Arrival, which was filmed here in Montreal, here in Quebec. And the character that uh, Amy Adams, I think the character's name was Louise Banks in the film, uh, Amy Adams worked with Jessica Kuhn on the dialogue and getting the description of the linguistics uh, aspects of the film Arrival correctly, correct. And then after the movie, Jessica Kuhn found that her research was influenced by her involvement in the film Arrival. So she's going to talk about how her involvement in that, in that film has advanced her thinking about interstellar communication. Thursday, the symposium ends at noon, and we're going to have a really quick uh, cold lunch of, of wraps. Uh, and as soon as that's done, people who have signed up for the tour of the Canadian Space Agency headquarters are going to be corralled onto a bus to bring you there. That tour is full, and we, we regret we cannot add any additional peop uh, people to the, the CSA tour. Uh, but there's a second event on, on Thursday afternoon that's called The Infinite. And this is a 3D virtual reality experience that was made in collaboration with the Canadian Space Agency on the International Space Station. And everyone who's done this event told me it is, it is really like a life altering experience. I mean, some people were weeping. Uh, they said it's just such a moving, moving experience. So this, we have lots of spots available for the infinite experience. If you wanna add that, all you need to do is log back into ConfTool. So if you can find your password uh, and you can, you can say, edit my details for your registration, you can add this event and pay with your credit card and, and attend it uh, on Thursday afternoon with us. So the plan is for the people with the blue shirts and the red hats to bring you there. This is gonna be in the old port of Montreal, to bring you there on the Montreal Metro system. So you get to experience our subway system. If you're not comfortable uh, with that, we're also gonna arrange sh shuttles to bring people there. Uh, if you'd like to do the infinite and you can't do it on Thursday afternoon, you're gonna be leaving, but you still really wanna have this experience, you're welcome to go to their website, just Google uh, you know, Space Explorers Infinite Montreal, you'll find it, and we have a discount code. So if you can write that down or take a picture of that, or you can get it from the registration desk. This uh, exhibit runs every day, all day, all week long. So if you wanna sneak out from a, I, no, no, Les is telling me don't say this, okay. But uh, if, if for some reason you would find yourself at the old port of Montreal, you wanna do this experience, you can get a 15% discount just for symposium attendees. So I'd like to acknowledge our, our, our partners and patrons for the symposium. We'll be seeing this slide a lot. We're gonna have it up through the entire uh, symposium. And I wanna particularly thank uh, Pratt Whitney who made a quite significant contribution to the conference. And in light of that, we've invited uh, a representative of Pratt and Whitney to come. So John Lewis from Pratt and Whitney is gonna come. If it's raining, we have a contingency for that. Yeah, it's gonna be an even bigger version of last night's tent, so. No, 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 we'll go inside the lobby. So the hotel is prepared to move us into the lobby for the uh, for the Sanka set tonight. Yeah, so we're really honored to have John Lewis here. Who is here? So I, I won't take a lot of your time. I'm not quite as tall as him. Uh, I won't take a lot of your time. Now it's time for, for a word from your sponsor. So yeah, my name's John Lewis. I work in Prime Whitney, Prime Whitney Canada specifically. 
and I've actually been there for 26 years after having graduated from McGill with a master's degree in metallurgical engineering in 1997. That's right? probably before some of you were born, uh, but then not in the case of others. So look, question occurred to maybe me and, and maybe you, why would Pran and Whitney be interested in, in sponsoring an event like this? It's quite a long way out there. We're, of course, a, a commercial company. We uh, who are listed on Wall Street as part of RTX. Why would we be interested? Well, a little bit of history. So our company, Pran & Whitney, was founded in 1925. So we're also a very old company. We're not SpaceX here. By a guy called Rentschler, who had an idea for an air-cooled radial aviation engine. He partnered with the Pran & Whitney tool company, came up with something called the Wasp. And the rest is history. That engine went on to power many famous aircraft, many famous flights, including those of Amelia Earhart. Um, and since then, we've gone on to power pretty much anything and everything you can imagine. We power helicopters. That's my particular um, nerdy fascination. Uh, but we also power turboprops, fighters, uh, wide bodies, narrow bodies, you name it, um, we're there. And through all of it, we've been at the forefront. Our JT-3 engine powered the 707, first widely used commercial airliner. Um, our, uh, I'm forgetting the name, JT-9. Our JT-9 engine powered the jumbo jet, of course, the wide body that democratized air travel, arguably. Um, and our most recent GTF engine provides double-digit improvements in fuel burn, in NOx, and in noise over other contemporary engines. And what about space? We had a space division for over 40 years. And for example, producing the RL-10 engine, which serves as the upper stages for the Atlas and Delta rockets, as well as the high-speed or the high-pressure turbo pumps for the space shuttle main engine. I think a lot of people say that a, a liquid fuel rocket engine is basically a turbo pump surrounded by some plumbing. So turbo pumps are very important and a massive investment in technology, as you might imagine. More recently, we provide the engines. Brown Whitney Canada actually provides the engines for White Knight 2, which I suppose many of you know carries Spaceship 2 to its launch altitude. And I'm sure many of you also know that uh, recently the first commercial flight of that arrangement was, uh, was announced for a successful commercial flight at the end of June. So we've been investing for many years and we continue. The, the, the uh, years between 2020 and 2025, we're investing about $14 billion in various aspects of our business. And you might ask, well, hasn't the gas turbine reached its summum? What can you possibly spend that kind of money on? Well, I'll give you three examples that are fairly contemporary. Of course, everybody knows that many industries, all industries really have to deal with the reality of carbon emissions and what they might cause. So three things that we're working on presently, the first is sustainable aviation fuels. All of our engines can presently burn a 50% blend of these things, but the question is, how do you get to 100%? And that's what we're working with OEMs and government agencies to try to get to. We're working on electric hybrid. We think we can get a 30% improvement on the modern turboprop, which by the way, for relatively short missions is the most efficient way of running an aircraft through using a hybrid arrangement that we hope to fly next year which is pretty much tomorrow as far as aviation timetables um, are concerned. We're modifying a Dash 8 aircraft to be able to do with that, to do that. And we're working on hydrogen again. We were one of the first companies to work on hydrogen as a propulsion uh, fuel for air breathing engines in the 1950s. Some of you may have heard of Project Suntan based in Florida. You can see where the uh, name might have come from. Well, today we're doing something a lot more sophisticated, not only burning hydrogen, but using the cryogenic properties of very cold hydrogen to improve combustion efficiency and to reduce emissions. So we've been investing for almost 100 years in aviation technology, almost half of which in space technology. So we feel a certain kinship for the kinds of discussions that you're having here. And we obviously also want to be a company that some of the younger amongst you, some of you are early in your careers, might want to consider working for. We employ about 6,000 people in Quebec, we employ about, about 40,000 people around the world, and many of them work on these cool ideas. So with that, I've looked at the agenda. Looks amazing. I hope you have a great week. Uh, the other thing that's very exciting about this meeting being the first time in Canada is uh, the involvement of the Canadian Space Agency. So it's a uh, real pleasure to introduce John Morris, who's the 
science advisor to the president of the Canadian Space Agency. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I'm here representing the Canadian Space Agency, but I'm also a professor too. And uh, what's really interesting to me about this particular conference is it's something that I've, I've dabbled a little bit in my uh, professional career as well with uh, my university. So I've tried to mix a little bit those two elements. You'll get a little bit of agency stuff and, and maybe just a little bit of, uh, of research too for fun. So first of all, I'd, I'd like to sort of kick off by mentioning that this is really an exciting time for space and for Canada in particular in space. Uh, the future of exploration is quite bright and Canada is poised to capitalize on opportunities. We're proud in particular to have a lunar program and to be part of the Artemis program, which really represents a giant leap for humanity. As Minister Champagne said on April 3rd in Houston, we are going back to the moon and then eventually to Mars. And then from there, who knows? So as you likely saw, we proudly announced that uh, Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen will be joining the international crew of Artemis II and Jeremy's going to write uh, history as part of a new generation of space explorers. Only 24 human beings have ever seen the complete blue marble that is the Earth, and have seen that from space. And Jeremy will soon be added to that list, the first Canadian. So when the Artemis II mission launches, Canada will become the second country to ever have sent an astronaut around the moon. Now, what's our contribution? You know, how did we get... A onto this mission. Well, we're building the Canada Arm 3, and this is for the Lunar Gateway. So this is a highly autonomous robotic system. It's going to be installed on the space station in lunar orbit. And by developing this uh, particular piece of equipment, it strengthens Canada's well-established global leadership in space robotics and supports the growth of the Canadian space industry. So Canada's industrial and technological benefits policy is going to ensure that Canadian organizations across the country including many small and medium-sized businesses, are going to benefit from this investment in Canadarm3. It's going to help them to grow their expertise, to grow their know-how, and to capture the fast-developing opportunities in key industrial capabilities in emerging markets. So this piece of equipment really uh, brings with it some new opportunities to grow our economy, our space sector, and create, of course, well-paying jobs. So it's also going to encourage young Canadians to pursue studies in STEM disciplines. And for a little bit on MDA, they're a company in Brampton, Ontario, that's mainly uh, working on this. They had previous experience with the original Canadarm and with Canadarm2. So I think that uh, this is really important, and that's because the moon is a stepping stone to Mars. It's a proving ground for deep space exploration, and we've got a good foundation for this here in Canada. We've led science experiments on the ISS for more than 20 years. But as we get further from home, we have to learn more. And these kinds of daring missions are going to pose bigger challenges than traveling just to the ISS, which is only, of course, 400 kilometers from the Earth. So we're going to need to deal with longer duration missions. We're going to have health risks for humans living without Earth's protective atmosphere and uh, our ionosphere. And there's going to be longer communications delays. And as you go, you know, even further out into that ultra deep space territory, um, these are going to become huge, huge issues. So these crews, their missions, they're going to require more independence. They're going to require more autonomy. And we can uh, work on that right here in our own solar system. And of course, the Canadian Space Agency, we're preparing for potential roles in these future missions by advancing technologies in areas of strength for Canada artificial intelligence, robotics, medical healthcare technologies. And really, it's for this reason that I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here with you all today at the 8th Interstellar Symposium. Uh, and that's because such technologies, these tools, these techniques, these are applicable not just to the moon, not even just to the Mars and inside our own solar system, but they are a stepping stone to explorations even deeper out into the cosmos. So if you'll indulge me just for a couple minutes here, I wanted to take a couple of slides just to talk about some of my own work um, and a particularly interesting application of some of the technologies that I'm sure will be discussed this week. So um, if any of you uh, know me, I'm actually a planetary scientist. I mostly work on this place, Mars. But um, I do, from time to time, take the expertise from here 
and, and go to other places. And a few years ago, some colleagues and I published a, an interesting paper looking at this uh, the starship concept, the, sorry, starship concept that's been around in the last 10 years or so. Uh, this is, of course, the idea of very, very miniaturized spacecraft with uh, a light sail that gets sped up to very high uh, velocities so they can go and visit other stellar systems. And as good planetary scientists, we wondered, is there something that you can do here in our own solar system for that sort of thing? So we were thinking, you know, how do you use this architecture and perhaps how do you use stepping stones along the way to that architecture uh, to do planetary science in our own solar system? And there's a number of interesting ways you can do that. You can do rapid response uh, exploration. Right now, if you uh, work in planetary science and there's an exciting discovery, then you look at that exciting discovery and you say, gee, I'm going to go and make a team. And then I'm going to put together uh, a proposal for NASA. And maybe in 10 years, we'll go and we'll explore that thing. Wouldn't it be great to go and do that tomorrow instead? And then you can you know, see because some of these things are only transitory types of things. You can think about frequently revisiting a target. You can think about something that requires a lot of eyes in a lot of different places in a huge volume of space. And something I really like is that this potentially makes space accessible to a larger number of actors with these small spacecrafts, that democratization that we've seen with things like CubeSats. And what we did, we took a bit of a small sat perspective here, not sort of thinking about these large payloads or these large velocities, but thinking about what could you do with sort of the minimum set of, you know, a laser and, and whatnot, and thinking about where you could go with that. And it turns out there's a lot of places that you can. And, and Canada is actually a, a nice place, not just for making miniaturized spacecraft and instruments, but also we have excellent seeing up in the north. So if you were to put your laser on the ground, there are some good, there's some good real estate here in this country for that. And something that really, um, you know, appealed to me as a Martian was thinking a little bit about, you know, these types of spacecraft. What is the fun and, and, and interesting inherent properties of them that make them useful for some things. So if you've got a very large surface area spacecraft that's very light, that is the perfect entry, descent, and landing vehicle. So if you want to go to the Martian surface, something like a starship or a planetary starship is a great way to do it. It's just like what happens with inter, uh, interplanetary dust particles. They slow down so fast that they can't actually heat up much. And so they can make it all the way to the ground, you know, very nicely. So if you want to talk with me more about that, catch me at the coffee break. So a few more uh, things just to mention back to, uh, you know, what the agency is doing here in Canada. We, of course, have the, uh, the Webb Space Telescope. We've been very, very excited about this. Uh, it's the most powerful and complex observatory, frankly, that's ever existed. And an international collaboration between NASA, the European Space Agency, and also the Canadian Space Agency. There's a good Montreal connection to this as well, not just the CSA, but also with the Université de Montréal, just over the hill, that uh, was responsible for leading elements of the near-infrared imager and slitless spectrograph, or NIRIS. And of course, the fine guidance sensor is also uh, a made-in-Canada product. So there have been some amazing discoveries made by, by this. Really, it comes down to Canada's world-class expertise in astronomy, science, engineering, in industry, government, and in universities. So we also are investing in science and technology that's going to keep astronauts safe and healthy on deep space missions, something that I think will become more important as we venture further and further out. Um, and the fact of the matter is that on lunar exploration missions, we're going to face many of the healthcare challenges that are already faced by remote, especially indigenous communities, like limited access to healthcare providers, medical equipment, and resources challenging medical evacuations and communications delays. So potentially there are things that we can learn getting ready for space that will help us back here on Earth as well. Nutrition also very important, um, whether you're staying close to home or going very deep in space. And we're doing a lot of tech development for producing food in health environments, both in space and on Earth. So for instance, we've got some, uh, some slides here talking about Kajoa Haven and Nunavut. Uh, so that's the Naruvik project. And this is a good example of this. It's a community-led initiative that is uh, converting shipping containers to grow fresh food all year round in a community 250 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. 
And of course, with NASA, we are also running the Deep Space Food Challenge, uh, which is looking at novel food production technologies or systems that require minimal inputs in terms of materials, energy, and water. And that helps us to maximize safe, nutritious, and palatable food for long duration space missions. So finally, Canada is a trusted partner in deep space equipment, most recently with OSIRIS-REx, that's the spacecraft you see here. And uh, this is Canada's first participation in asteroid sample return. So we have uh, a laser altimeter on this spacecraft called OLA, and it has produced the most detailed 3D measurements of any celestial body ever explored. So this is a place that really uh, has the potential to unlock some of the most fundamental questions about the formation of our solar system and the origins of, of life on Earth. And in exchange for instrument contribution here, Canada acquires part of the sample that comes back from Bennu. Um, and that'll be for study for the science team for future generations. And we'll be developing a curation facility for this at the CSA out in saint Hubert, and samples will be distributed from there. The sample comes back very soon. It's September of 2023. So I'd like to thank you for having me here and thank you on behalf of the Canadian Space Agency. I'd like to wish you a productive and thought-provoking conference. So thank you very much. Okay, so... Uh... Again, this is the first time the Interstellar Symposium has been held joint uh, in, in, in partnership with the International Academy of the Ast of Astronautics. And so, uh, Les, would you be able to come up and introduce uh, our IAA partners that are here? Thanks so much. This is a little awkward because I understand I'm going to be the recipient of a certificate uh, while I'm up here today. And so I, it's going to be a little awkward introducing the partners that are here. Um, we have, uh, and Andrew, you're going to have to help me out because I don't know the bio and background of our guests as much as you do. And that's why there's a little bit of confusion okay. here. And I greatly apologize. So we're going to have uh, John Schumacher, who's the president of the IAA. Les, you're not supposed to know you get an award. It's supposed to be a surprise. Uh, it was in the emails I got, so I... <laughs> How do I advance slide? Fantastic. Fantastic, thanks. Well, thanks very much, and uh, it's great to be here. I have to say, I haven't been at an opening ceremony that got this exciting before you even get into the presentations. The Interstellar Research Group, who, by the way, has by far the best art I've ever seen for conferences. I'll show you a couple of the prior ones. It's it's just crazy how good they are. Um, but bringing together and that the multidisciplinary approach to interstellar space, that's what the International Academy of Astronautics has done since it started back in 1960. And then Claudio, thanks for all your work on doing this. Claudio is one of those unsung heroes that keeps on doing these kind of things. And he, he will make me stop, but he does just a beautiful job of bringing top researchers, program people from around the world together. The Academy was formed in 1960, height of the Cold War. A group of people got together, really good minds from around the world, and said, we need to quietly promote international cooperation across the divide, the Cold War divide, and they did that. Um, so that's why, what a wonderful thing to be doing today, Interstellar Research Group, yet another leap into a, another area um, which has a great push. I have to tell you, I have too many left brain, right brain, middle brain conversations going on because, John, I love the propulsion. You know, I'm an Aerojet Rocketdyne now. It's at NASA. We power, Aerojet Rocketdyne powers the Voyager spacecraft that are in interstellar space after 45 years across the heliosphere of the 20 teens. Um, and we were uh, the majority of the propulsion on Artemis on um, launch with SLS and then on Orion taking the uh, human-rated spacecraft the furthest it's ever gone from Earth. So uh, we do thermal, uh, less we do nuclear thermal like you love. We do ion, it's, it's crazy. So, because um, how do you get interstellar? You you either use creative propulsion solutions we have today or you invent new ones. And then you have to handle all the other aspects. So it's just wonderful how we come together in a multidisciplinary way. So 
I'm going to take you through these slides real quick because I've talked about most of them. First off, oh, come on, look at this. Oh, the, the, the name of the conference and the thought you provoke with that and that touch beyond just programmatics is awesome to the, the legal side, the artistic side. It's fantastic. Um, and the art is crazy. Look at that. Those from prior conferences and the one for this one, The Light of Other Worlds, is stunning. Okay. Um, one thing we didn't touch on yet, and you'll hear from Julia Payette in just a minute, um, you also bring in trailblazers that have actually been in space and been in government, worked in on the ground, been an astronaut, and understand what it takes to actually do um, an international mission of great consequence. And I'll tell you a little more about Julia in just a second here. Okay. So a couple of slides on the Academy. Like I said, formed in 1960 um, in four sections, but it's meant that those sections define areas and then work those areas, but also come together in a multidisciplinary way. And it's right today, about 1,200 uh, Academy editions, leaders across the world in their disciplines, the way people are selected. Um, it's a highly selective process, as you can imagine. Um, Accommoditions nominate people. Um, those selected by the by the Accommoditions are called corresponding members. They're corresponding members for five years. They're already very highly regarded in their community. Um, then it's the work they do with the Academy. And in addition to that, some are selected to be full members of the Academy. And then our highest award is called an honorary member, and very few people have gotten that. Okay. Um, this is what's so cool. These are the kind of things over the years what the Academy has done uh, from the 60s, really going out and trying to, to push on ideas that um, some people were thinking about, some people in the discipline. And that's why this work and this new coordination with the uh, collaboration with the Interstellar Research Group is so important because it builds on these kind of ideas that have gone over the years. And if you saw, for example, uh, planetary defense, uh, NASA just did the first planetary defense mission uh, with with um, DART, and it's the touch point of a start about discussion about how you can actually go out and do a uh, a mission, get the funding like Les was talking about, and then go out and do it, and build international consensus to go on and do other missions. And I can take you through the whole list. Space traffic management is a huge one, both um, mitigating, but also being creative in the future, small sets. Um, the revolution on how you go forward with using Leo, Mio, and then interspace. Okay. Um, I, the one item I highlight here is the journal Ast Acta Astronautica, um, which Les touched on. We're going to do a special section on in Acta um, on this conference, on this symposium, and that's what we do. Uh, it's the number one space journal in the world. Again, highly regarded, and we try and keep that level of, of article um, discourse in it. And so this work with the IRG, this symposia, is very fitting to have a special section in ACTA and get that. ACTA goes out to universities around the world. Um, it's online, and it's available, and I can give you more information if, if that's of interest to you. Okay. And... Uh, I'm going to say enjoy the symposium. I'll be back to you, but uh, to present a couple of certificates. But first, uh, it's my great privilege to introduce Julie Payette. Um, Julie, if you read her bio, um, she's been everything. Um, and first, at many of them, a true trailblazer. Um, she's been Secretary General for Canada um, in government. She's worked in the museum and the outreach area there. I got to know Julie as an astronaut, a Canadian Space Agency astronaut. Um, she was the first Canadian um, to cross into the International Space Station, operated all three arms, um, the shuttle uh, cadet arm, cadet arm two on the station, and the special purpose arm on Kibo, the Japanese, uh, Japanese element for space station. Um, she worked as Capcom for NASA. Um, two different missions, uh, over 610 hours in space, um, just on and on and on. If you, you go through Julie's bio, it's a series of trailblazing first, 
She's an alum for McGill, which we're very fortunate to be here. And uh, shout out to CS and over the years to really advance space exploration. So with that, over to someone you'll find much more. I'm by far the smallest. Bonjour. Bonjour tout le monde. Bienvenue à Montréal. Avant de commencer, j'aimerais saluer en particulier les gens ici dans cette salle qui font de la recherche en français. Il y a eu un symposium il n'y a pas longtemps, en avril, euh, qui était avec le scientifique en chef et le Fonds de recherche du Québec. Ce n'est pas toujours facile de parler le français dans un domaine aussi euh, pointu que l'aérospatial, mais on peut le faire et on peut le faire jusqu'en orbite de la Terre. Alors, je vous salue particulièrement. But now I'm going to revert to the common language, if you like. It was a kudo to the fact that doing science in other languages has never been that easy. Most of the books, most of the papers, most of the conferences are done in specific languages, which is great because if you like languages, you get to learn different languages, but doing uh, science in your mother tongue is always uh, particularly good. So already, thank you very much, John. He's stolen most of what I was going to say because I thought I was in a very unique position to welcome those of you who are not from Montreal or not from Canada into this beautiful city. One, because I'm a native. This is my hometown. I was born in Montreal a long time ago, and I am actually a 12th generation Montrealer because the ancestor that gave my family name came from France. He was a soldier, and he showed up here in 1655 as dans le régiment carignan salière for those who know the history. And he met someone that was already there, that was already a first-generation uh, Canadian immigrant at the time. And because of that, then uh, I'm 12, and my son is 13, born on the island of Montreal. So we're islanders. As you can see from this photo taken from space by an astronaut, uh, all these pieces kind of fit together. And that is one of the things that you see all the time in space is geology is at work. Plate tectonics is at work right now. We don't feel it, but we can see it. And the further we go, the better perspective we get. We will always push the boundary of the known world as a species. The better way to do it is to do it together in collaboration. The second reason why I'm in a good position to welcome you to Montreal is because I'm an alum of McGill University. I graduated in engineering here in 1986. The microprocessor had just showed up in the computer science department a couple of years before I graduated and I took a course in computer science because I was electrical engineering and we don't mix still. And we needed to go there and that thing was called a Macintosh and it had a word processor on it. So I didn't have to use Underwood uh, that my mom had given me, and which I use with a lot of liquid paper, by the way. So I graduated from McGill University I then uh, started a PhD here in uh, the mid-1990s, and I was, uh, through my comprehensive, going into uh, my dissertation. I was doing that with the Center of Intelligent Machine uh, here at McGill uh, when I got a call from the president of the Canadian Space Agency telling me that I had been uh, given a spot in the... Uh, astronaut school in North America, which is the NASA Johnson Space Center. So I had to report to NASA to train uh, to become uh, uh, an astronaut. So I just left and did not complete my PhD. But it is really very special for me. And the last reason, there was three reasons why, is because, of course, I'm not an interstellar traveler. But I am uh, a bit of an extraterrestrial, and I have had the opportunity to go to space twice. Uh, on the first docking mission to the International Space Station at the very beginning, when there was only two modules, nobody on board, and we had to turn the lights on when we arrived. 
and a second mission in 19, in 2009, when I participated in two, one of the last assembly missions of the International Space Station. And when we arrived there with a piece of the uh, Japanese module, the Kibo platform, outside platform, there were six people on board. We were seven people on board the Space Shuttle Endeavour, six people on board the Space Station, so six to seven, 13. That is the record still standing today of the number of people together in the same spacecraft. That record is to be broken, and I look forward to that. This is what... This is what this is all about. I uh, had a, an interview a couple of days ago with a, a, a national network, and they were asking me, uh, well, what about this conference, uh, Interstellar? Interstellar? Uh, isn't that Star trek -y a little bit? And I say, well, if you look at Star Trek, they were quite visionary. There's a number of things in the show that, that didn't exist then and exist today. I'm still waiting for teletransportation. When you guys figure that one out, I want to, I want to go. Because these days, airplane travel is, uh, well, that's what it is. So the, uh, uh, the, the way to, to approach this is uh, uh, to really think forward. And that's what you're doing here. So during this interview with the Interstellar, one of the things that uh, the interviewer said uh, was, uh, who are these people that are participating in a conference? Uh, can they be trusted? <laughs> and I, I'm like, I, I mean, I think she was thinking of uh, something with artificial intelligence, that everybody that worked in artificial intelligence, which is you and your brother, if you've ever worked with computer, it, it, should they be trusted? Well... I said, well, should, should we have trusted Leonardo da Vinci when he was drawing flying machines 600 years before it actually became real? We need to think ahead all the time. And a lot of what we're doing while we're thinking ahead provokes discovery and invention and development and benefits that are applicable right here on Earth immediately. John mentioned very briefly that uh, I am a member of the International Academy of Astronautics. I ride on the shoulders of giants. There's been many of, of scientists and, and trailblazers before in the academy. Many of my colleagues uh, who've done first flights, uh, who've done first spacewalks, who have done first spacewalks on the moon, but I still have. Uh, colleagues that work inside the international uh, and the IAA. Uh, Dorin Prunariu is from Romania, and he works on the basic science uh, section. And uh, Chiaki Mukai, who is a scientist from Japan, who works in the life science uh, department. We are all together into this business because physics, that dictates the laws in which spacecraft move about, has decided that when we orbit, we can't stop. We can't, inside the space station, say, oh, uh, here we're over uh, Britain. So, oh, by the way, we're over Britain for about five seconds. So uh, in an orbit of an hour and a half. Uh, in Canada, we're over Canada, the second largest country in the world for 10 minutes from Vancouver to St. John, Newfoundland. It, it goes fast in low Earth orbit. When we're there, we, we cannot see borders. This planet of ours is the unique place where we can live and thrive. Nowhere else at the moment. One day, we might discover other worlds. Hopefully, when we do, we do so as a species and not as a representative of a particular country. Though it is kind of fun to be uh, doing that for your own country. On board the space station right now, seven people from different nationalities, three Russians, three American, and one astronaut, first one, from the Emirates. Uh, this crew is changing about every six months, depending on how things are going. 
it just happens that the station is visiting you on this seminar this week in Montreal. Now, weather might be a factor, but if you got you got several opportunities as listed here. If if you've never seen, I I doubt. There is anybody in this room that has not seen the station pass by. But just in case you'd like to see it again, you can see it tonight. 22.38 is the time. Whoops. That will help. Right. So if you look 10th of July, 22.35 Southwest. So you basically look at the horizon with your phone Southwest and you just wait. And there will be a star rising if the, the sky is clear. And if you see it at the Southwest at 2235, a star rising and it's on the move, it is the space station. It is not a UFO or anything like that. But there's several opportunities. This is uh, from the site Heavens Above, which uh, calculates the uh, trajectory of all visible uh, satellites in, uh, in space and uh, depending on your geographical location. So it's kind of fun. Since the age of time, we've been looking at the sky, wondering what's out there? What does it do? Where, where can we go? Is it important? Does it influence us? But it's been only 400 years since the birth of modern science that we really start having facts about who we are, where we fit, and how little and somewhat insignificant we are in the huge universe. And then even 400 years ago when Galileo was saying, no, 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 we don't, we're not the center of the world and the sun doesn't rotate around us it, and there are other things that rotate around other planets. He was excom excommunicated and, and put in house arrest and, had, and finished his life in, in terrible circumstances. But he was right. And he was right because he was a person that could see ahead. And that's what you're doing here. And don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Because indeed, we are in the most exciting time. Actually, it's always exciting about space. But now this is particularly exciting. We're rewriting the astronomy book almost every day with the James Webb, with the other telescope and even the terrestrial telescope. We are now able together with consortium of scientists from all over the world to take this picture of the event horizon of a black hole. We now know that there are more than 5,000 planets that rotate around other suns than ours. In 1995, that's yesterday, we discovered the first one. Now we know that for sure that there are 5,000 and such by count. This is the picture I wanted. But we also can calculate and do statistics. If we find so many planets around so many other suns, then that's probably because it's the norm. Planetary system are the norm. And one day, somebody will go and visit that. It might not be tomorrow, but again, that preparation might take, just like Leonardo, 600 years. With the opening of commercial space, it, this frontier, which was the exclusive realm of only a few nations and a few people, is now opening up to a lot more people and a lot more diversity of people. Yes, we're going back to the moon 50-some years after setting foot there. And this time, we hope to be able to establish colonies, settle there at least have people come back and forth. There will be young people born today who will be working in that industry and going back and forth to our satellite in the coming years. That, again, was not predictable 60, 70 years ago. But before we get there, there is a mountain of issues to solve. And in this room, there are scientists, researchers, thinkers, academicians, professors, and even the general public that might have ideas to propel us forward. I have two examples of the reason why when we search and look and ask questions, it can lead to something that makes 
a whole lot different. There's a professor at the University of Toronto. Her name is Dr. Barbara Sherwood Lawler. She's an astrobiologist and she wanted to uh, uh, collect samples in the deep rocks of the Canadian shield rocks in order to prepare herself for a collecting of water on Mars to determine if there are any biological uh, mm -hmm. elements in it. So in order to test some of the techniques that they had, they went into the Canadian shield and extracted some water at the bottom of a mine in north of Sudbury. And uh, she thought it was really old water, and with that, she'd be able to test her techniques. But using isotope-based uh, analysis, they discovered that the water they did extracted was one billion years old. And when that was confirmed, the water had been taken out uh, without as much care, so they went back and then this time extracted again within the rocks more water that they can then analyze, and that water was 2.5 billion years old. Now, it happens that 2.5 billion years ago, life started into the ancient oceans uh, and crust of the Earth. And we believe, our astrobiologists believe, that that was only possible because, actually, life was already there, but the oxygen that started to become the atmosphere of the Earth was possible because of life. So life had an impact on how our planet works today. So a discovery always leads to another. The other example you might hear for yourself in two days from now when she presents, uh, uh, she's an expert in synthetic biology. She's in the room right now. My colleague, Lynn Rothschild from uh, NASA Ames. And one of the projects that she's got in line with NASA right now, which hopefully will be accepted, is how do you do laundry in space with no water or little water using ozone or carbon dioxide and, and other techniques like that? Well, I can tell you that this is a really important problem to solve because there's no such thing as an astronaut that wants to go on a mission with dirty underwear. And that mission is coming. So again, good luck, all the best, have a great symposium and Yes, this is the next step, and it's looming, and we probably see it in our lifetime. A person standing on the soil of planet Mars. But that person is not going to be alone, not going to grow potatoes uh, with things. But I hope, it's my biggest wish, that that person, when they or she will, he will step on Mars, will do so not just for one nation, but on behalf of us. Thank you very much. Okay, I told you this would be a lot better than my presentation. Um, but Julie is always very inspirational, and she's done that for decades and touched so many people. Um, real quickly, I've, we have two awards. And again, as I said earlier, um, with the International Academy. Obviously, we encourage everyone to participate in, anyone can participate in an academy, study a project, that type of thing. You can see them on our website and uh, also submit to ACTA. Um, and then in the process of coming to acquisitions to get elected as a corresponding member and then a full member, um, all, all possible and it's on that slide and the website is there. If you have any questions, please ask me. Um, we, we have a uh, awards gala each year, and then we take the opportunity to take that on the road. Um, so very privileged today to give two awards here. Um, the first is to Les Johnson. Les, if you can come on up. And I just, just quickly on Les, uh, because he won't tell you, um, a large record of accomplishment, over 90 publications, um, formulation manager for nuclear thermal propulsion, propulsion at Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, principal investigator on two planned space mission, the near Earth asteroid scout and solar cruiser, co investigator on Lisa T, co investigator on T Rex with Japanese Space Agency, oversaw the development of multiple advanced propulsion technologies when he managed NASA in space propulsion technology project. Um, 
He's also authored popular science books, has multiple pens, and uh, the Interstellar Research Group, you can see his fingerprints all over that. So, Les, great congratulations from the Academy. I want to just give you this award. And Les was a corresponding member um, and uh, became a corresponding member in 2018. In 2022, he was elected a full member of the Academy. So, Les, congratulations. Thank you very much. Very nice. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Very Thanks. And uh, Julie, if you could come back to the stage. So it's a, a great, great privilege um, to present uh, Julie Payette with the Academy's highest honor. This is actually delayed for a couple of years, so lucky me, because of COVID. Um, we're recognizing Julie um, in recognition for her contributions to the development of astronautics, to international cooperation, and the peaceful uses of outer space, and to the activities of the International Academy of Astronautics across the board. Um, the honorary, me mem uh, honorary member designation is very rarely given. Uh, Julie uh, joins John Glenn and Valentia Tereshkova. Uh, those type of folks in getting that award. So, truly, congratulations to you and from the Academy. Thank you. And with that, uh, again, thanks to Andrew, uh, Les, and Doug for all the work in setting up the conference and for setting up the Delta party tonight. They can watch the station go over at about 10.30. It's awesome. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.